Welcome to section 8 of Musculoskeletal Anatomy. In this video, we'll discuss lumbar radiculopathy. Let's get started. Radiculopathy is defined as a range of symptoms due to pinching of a nerve root as it exits the vertebral column. This is most commonly due to a herniated disc, but may also be caused by spinal stenosis less frequently. Either way, this results in a variety of symptoms, most commonly numbness, weakness, pain, and altered reflexes. In order to understand this better, let's look at some of the anatomy. This is a nice overview image showing the anatomy associated with radiculopathy. The left part of the image is a superior view, and the right part of the image is a lateral view. Let's focus on the right part of the image first. Notice that this is anterior, and this is posterior. You can see the neural foramen right here, which is where the nerve exits the vertebral column. Notice that the herniated disc is protruding posteriorly, which compresses the spinal nerve root. So you can see the spinal nerve right here, and you can see that it's getting compressed by this herniated intervertebral disc. Okay, now let's focus on the superior view. So from this view, this part of the image is anterior, and this part of the image is posterior. This view allows us to see the intervertebral disc quite well. Notice that the outer aspect is called the annulosus fibrosus, and the inner aspect is called the nucleus pulposus. As the annulus fibrosus degenerates, the nucleus pulposus herniates outward, hence the name herniated disc. The intervertebral discs most commonly herniate posterior laterally into this region shown in the image right here. But why exactly does this happen? Well, let's take a closer look. The image on the right allows us to see the anterior longitudinal ligament right here and the posterior longitudinal ligament right here. As you can see, these are two ligaments that surround and insulate the intervertebral disc. Therefore, they prevent it from herniating out from its normal anatomical location. However, the posterior longitudinal ligament is thinner and weaker than the anterior longitudinal ligament, which means that under stress, the disc is more likely to protrude posteriorly. If we look at the left part of the image, we can see that the intervertebral disc most commonly protrudes posterior laterally, and it may also protrude right into the central canal. So you can see the disc right here. It's protruding posterior laterally, and you can see the central canal right here. So sometimes it can go into this area. If we look back at the right part of the image, notice that the intervertebral disc is shown herniating posteriorly and inferiorly. So if this were the disc between L3 and L4, then it would be compressing the L4 spinal nerve. Remember, all of the nerves below C7 exit below their corresponding vertebrae. So if this were the L4 vertebra, then the nerve I've pointed to with the green arrow would be the L4 spinal nerve. Okay, now that we've covered herniated discs, let's discuss spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis is exactly what it sounds like, narrowing of the spine. However, this is kind of a vague term. So more specifically, it's caused by narrowing of the central canal. This results in compression of a nerve root, which then causes radiculopathy. For step one, it's high yield to know that the symptoms are worse when standing and alleviated when the patient bends forward, such as when riding a bike. Let's pull up an image so you can see why this happens. This is an excellent depiction of spinal stenosis showing a lateral view of the spine. The left side shows the anatomy during extension, or standing, and the right side shows the anatomy during flexion, or when bending forward. This entire region is the central canal. In order to really understand the pathology here, you need to recall that the spinal cord terminates as the conus medullaris, and this occurs around the T12 to L2 region. Therefore, all of the lumbar and sacral spinal nerve roots emanate off of the conus medullaris around this region. You can see that depicted in this image right here and right here. In spinal stenosis, there are several contributing factors that result in narrowing of the central canal. But one of the easiest to see in this image is the ligamentum flavum. So notice that during spine extension that the ligamentum flavum buckles anteriorly. So you can see that shown right here. The ligamentum flavum is a bit more prominent. However, when the patient is bending forward, such as when riding a bike or sitting, the spine is in a flexed position and the ligamentum flavum no longer buckles forward. So it's back to normal right here. So as you can see, spinal stenosis will present with symptoms of radiculopathy when standing because the ligamentum flavum buckles forward and compresses the spinal nerve roots. So again, spinal stenosis is caused by narrowing of the central canal, which results in nerve root compression and radiculopathy. There are many causes, including hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavum, age-related disc degeneration, facet joint arthropathy, and spondylolisthesis, or slippage of a vertebra. Ultimately, 
Any of these causes may result in compression of the central canal right here. Spondylolisthesis can be a little hard to visualize, so let's discuss this in a bit more detail. This is simply slippage of a vertebral body. Most commonly, the superior vertebral body slips anteriorly on top of the adjacent inferior vertebral body. So for example, L3, right here, could slip down and anteriorly, like this. The vertebra may also slip posteriorly, but this is less common. When either scenario happens, the nerve roots are often affected, resulting in radiculopathy. Okay, now that we've discussed the causes of radiculopathy, let's focus a bit more on other important findings. We introduced this image in the lumbosacral plexus video, but it's also helpful in understanding radiculopathy. From the image, you can see the sciatic nerve right here as it courses down the posterior aspect of the leg. This nerve is most frequently associated with lumbar radiculopathy. The sciatic nerve originates from the L4 to S3 region, so if the nerve roots are compressed at these regions, it can result in symptoms of radiculopathy along the distribution of the sciatic nerve. This is also sometimes referred to as sciatica. The way you'll most often be tested on this topic is with regards to the associated dermatomal and myotomal levels, as well as the affected clinical reflexes. So for example, the question stem may say that the L5 to S1 disc has herniated, and you'll be expected to know what myotome, dermatome, and reflexes have been affected. In order to understand this, we'll need to review myotomes, dermatomes, and clinical reflexes. This is a table of the spinal cord levels and their associated dermatomes. We covered this more in the neurology chapter, but it's here for your review. With regards to lumbar radiculopathy, we should really be focused on the information from L4 to S3. So you can see that if the L4 nerve root was affected, then patients would develop sensory deficits along the patella and medial malleolus. L5 for the dorsum of the foot, S1 for the lateral malleolus, and S2 through S4 for the perineal region. This is a table from neurology of the spinal cord levels and their associated myotomes. Again, L4 is associated with knee extension, L5 is associated with ankle dorsiflexion, S1 with ankle plantar flexion, and S2 through S4 with obtaining an erection. This is a table from neurology of the spinal cord levels and their associated clinical reflexes. L3 through L4 are associated with the patellar reflex, S1 through S2 are associated with the Achilles reflex, and S3 through S4 are associated with the anal wink reflex. Okay, let's do a question so you can see how you'll be tested on this material. A 27-year-old male presents to the office due to back pain, which began suddenly yesterday morning while working in his garden. He states that the pain starts near his buttock region and radiates down the left lateral aspect of his leg. On physical exam, straight leg testing is positive on the left. Left dorsiflexion is weaker when compared to the right. There is also sensory loss along the dorsum of the foot. A herniated disc at what level is most likely responsible for this patient's condition? A, L4 to L5, B, L5 to S1, C, S1 to S2, D, S2 to S3, or E, S3 to S4. Hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this patient has sciatica, which we can deduce based upon his pain that starts near the buttock region and radiates down the left lateral aspect of his leg. This is most commonly due to a herniated disc, which is likely what occurred with this patient based upon the acute nature of his condition. L5 or S1 compression are most commonly affected. In this patient, the L5 nerve root is compressed. Recall that the L5 dermatome is associated with the dorsum of the foot, and the L5 myotome is associated with dorsiflexion of the foot. L5 compression also results in pain that radiates along the lateral aspect of the leg, whereas an S1 compression results in pain that radiates along the posterior aspect of the leg. So if the L5 nerve root is compressed, a herniated disc at what level is most likely responsible? The correct answer is A, L4 to L5. Remember, a herniated disc protrudes posterolaterally and inferiorly, which means the nerve roots below the herniated disc are compressed. Therefore, a herniated disc at L4 to L5 would compress the nerve roots of L5. From the table, recall that the dermatome L5 is associated with the dorsum of the foot. From this table, recall that the myotome of the L5 spinal cord level is associated with ankle dorsiflexion. If we look back at this image, we can see this more clearly. So for example, if this were the L4 vertebra and this were the L5 vertebra, then the herniated disc right here would compress the L5 nerve root. So this would be the L4 nerve root and this would be the L5 nerve root and L5 would be the one that's compressed. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the question to discuss one more point. You may have noticed in the question stem that this patient had a positive straight leg test. This image shows the straight leg test. This is a physical exam maneuver used to screen for lumbar radiculopathy. 
In this test, the examiner asks the patient to keep their leg straight, and then they raise their leg up to 90 degrees. If the test is positive, then the patient will experience radiating pain down past the knee. This patient had a positive straight leg test, which makes lumbar radiculopathy more likely.